McMahon, New York City, also a Sequoia shareholder. Uh, ben Graham Investing encouraged turnover. Looking at Berkshire's holdings, concentration, and long term, are you still a 15% Phil Fisher and 85% Graham? <laughs> I don't know what the percentage would be. I'm 100% Ben Graham in, in those three points I mentioned earlier, and those really count. I am very, I was very influenced by Phil Fisher when I first read his two books back around 1960 or thereabouts, and I think that they're terrific books. I think Phil is a terrific guy. Um, so I think I probably gave that percentage to, I think I first used it in Forbes one time when Jim Michaels wrote me, and I, I think I, you know, it was one of those things I just named a number. But I, I, think it, I, I think I'd rather think of myself as being a sort of 100% Ben Graham and 100% Phil Fisher in, in the points where they don't, uh, and they really don't contradict each other. It, it's just that they had a, vastly different emphasis. Uh, ben would not have disagreed with the proposition that if you can find a business with a high rate of return on capital that can keep using more capital on that, that that's the best business in the world. And of course he made it, most of his money on a Geico, which was precisely that sort of business. So he recognized it, it's just that he felt that the other system of buying things that were statistically very cheap and buying a large number of them uh, was an easier policy to apply and one that was a little more teachable. He would have felt that he would have felt that Phil Fisher's approach was less teachable than his, but his had a more limited value because it was not it was not workable with lar really large sums of money. At Graham Newman Corp, Graham Newman Corp was a closed end fund. Oh, it, was, it was technically an open end fund, but it had six million dollars of of net worth. And, and Newman and Graham, the partnership that was affiliated with, it, had six million. So you had a you had a total pool of 12 million. Well, you could go around buying little machine tool companies, stocks in machine tool companies, whatever it might be, that, all statistically cheap. And that was a very good group operation. Uh, and he had to, you have, if you own a lousy business, you have to sell it at, at some point. I mean, if you own a group of lousy businesses, you better hope some of them get taken over or something happens. You need turnover. If you own a wonderful business, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't want turnover, basically. Charlie? What was interesting to me about the Phil Fisher businesses is that a very great many of them didn't last as wonderful businesses. One of his businesses was Title Insurance and Trust Company, which dominated the state of California. It had the biggest title plant, which was maintained by hand, and it had great fiscal solvency and integrity and so forth. It just dominated a lucrative field, and along came the computer. And now you could create a, for a few million dollars a title plan and keep it up without an army of clerks. And pretty soon we had 20 different title companies and they would go to great big customers like big lenders and big real estate brokers and pay them outlandish commissions by the standards of yore and, uh, and bid away huge blocks of business. And, and in due course, in the state of California, the aggregate earnings of all the title insurance co companies combined went below zero starting with a virtual monopoly. So, well, it looked like a monopoly, so uh, very few companies are so safe that you can just look ahead 20 years. And, and technology is sometimes your friend and it's sometimes your bitter enemy. If uh, Title Insurance and Trust Company had been smart, they would have looked on that computer, which they saw as a cost reducer, as one of the worst curses that ever came to man. You can, it probably takes more business experience and insights to some degree to apply Phil Fisher's approach than it does Graham's approach. If you, uh, uh, the only problem is you may be shut out of doing anything for a long time with Ben's approach and, and, and you may have a, gr a lot of difficulty in doing it with big money. But if you strictly applied, for example, his working capital test to security, you know, it, 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 it will work. It just may not work on a very big scale, and, and there may be periods when you're not, you're not doing much. Ben really was more of a teacher than a, 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 I mean, he had no urge to make a lot of money. It did, it, it did not interest him. So he was, he really wanted something that he thought was teachable in, in, as a <laughs> cornerstone of his philosophy and, or approach. And, uh, he felt you could read his books sitting out here in Omaha and apply 
buying things that were statistically cheap and you didn't have to have any special insights about business or consumer behavior or anything of the sort. Uh, and I don't think there's any question about that being true, but I also don't think you can, you can manage lots of money uh, in accord with it.